In this section, we'll discuss solutions for simple harmonic motion. So recall uh, the expression for Hooke's law. The mass times the acceleration is going to be equal to the Hooke's law force, which is minus kx. This is the second order derivative uh, in time. And so that means that uh, when we have a solution for x as a function of t, it's going to involve two constants for the motion. And these constants will end up translating into the initial uh, displacement and the initial velocity. And so in order to solve the problem completely for x as a function of time, we're going to need to know both the initial displacement and the initial velocity. And these two constants, as I say, will turn out to depend on these two initial values. Now, as the book discusses, there's several different ways to write the solution for x as a function of t, and they all involve some kind of sinusoidal uh, expression. You can write the solution as a combination of sines and cosines. You can write the solution as maybe a, a cosine with a, a, a phase angle, delta, or you can use uh, complex notation and express it as a sum of, of complex functions, where each of these constants, c1, c2, those are both complex numbers, so they can have a real and imaginary part. Um, often, converting the initial velocity and position into values for these constants and these different expressions, that's kind of left uh, as a detail that's never really explained. So in this section, rather than trying to walk through everything that the book discusses, I'm going to describe how to actually solve for the constants uh, of integration in each of these different solutions, at least for the, the second two, to give you a sense for how you can actually apply these solutions to a real problem. We'll start with the sum of the two imaginary terms. So uh, here's that solution again. In reality, remember C1, C2, they both have uh, imaginary and real components. So this full expression up here can be rewritten as uh, the real component of C1 plus the imaginary component times I times the cosine omega t plus I times sine omega t. That's what this exponential is. And then you have a similar expression here for the second term. And so just keep in mind that uh, this expression here actually contains a lot more information than it might be obvious. Than that might be obvious. And so uh, now let's move to uh, expressing C1 and C2 in terms of the, of the initial velocities, uh, the initial velocity and displacement. And so we imagine our oscillator at time t equals zero has some initial displacement x naught. And if we plug in t equals zero to that previous expression for x as a function of time, we'll find that we get that the right-hand side is c1 plus c2. So this gives us one equation for the two variables. Um, if we imagine that the initial velocity is v0, we take a time derivative of that previous equation and then set, plug in t equals zero, we get this expression for the right-hand side. And so now we have two equations and two unknowns, and so we have enough to solve for them. So we can take that first equation and just solve it for c1 as a function of c2. You find c1 is just x0 minus c2. So now we'll take this equation and plug it into here. And we get this. v0 is going to be i omega times x0 minus c2. This is all coming from c1 minus c2 again. And so we can wrap this up to give us an expression for c2 in terms of, of v0 and x0. And we get this. c2 is a half times x0 minus v0 over i omega. So we're rewriting, rewriting at solution c2 is all of this. Now we're going to rationalize this second term. Basically, we're going to put i on top. Um, 1 over i is, of course, just going to be equal to 1 over i times i over i. i rise is just 1, so we're just multiplying through by 1. We can rewrite this expression as i over i squared. And, of course, i squared, that's minus 1. So we find that 1 over i is actually just equal to negative i. And our solution for C2 is now this. So it's a half of a half times x0 plus i times v0 over omega. And we're going to take this and plug this back in for C1 to solve for C1. Remember, we originally had this expression. C1 is x0 minus C2. Plug in our solution for C2. We get this. And finally, our solution for C1 is this. So let's go and plug this, these uh, solutions for C1 and C2 back into our, our full uh, solution for x of t and see what that looks like. 
So remember what our solution uh, was, uh, C1 times e to the i omega t plus C2 e to the minus i omega t. So let's plug in for C1 and C2. And also replace these e to the i omega terms uh, with the cosine and sine equivalent. So we get these, this uh, big expression. Remember e to the i omega t is cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. Ooh, we left off an i here. And we left off an i here. And so e to the i omega t becomes this and this. C1 uh, is this here. So that's the C1 times e to the i omega t, that first line. And then the second line is going to be C2, which is here and here, times uh, cosine omega t minus i sine omega t. So that's this. We can see we get some nice cancellations. For instance, uh, this term is going to cancel with this term and a few other cancellations and finally we get we can also see for instance that this term is going to cancel with that term and so what we end up with is this nice solution at the bottom x naught cosine omega t times uh, v naught over omega sine omega t you can see for instance this uh, at x equals, excuse me, at t equals zero, uh, this term is going to be zero, and we just get x naught. To get time derivative, you'll find that this, that the second term is the only thing that survives at t equals zero. And so this is how uh, you actually solve for c1 and c2 uh, in terms of your initial conditions. And so let's just inspect the solution that we've we've just developed. Remember, we've got x of t is x naught cosine plus v naught over omega sine. So the x naught cosine uh, term is going to look a little like this. So that's what the x x naught cosine term is going to look like. And so here's x naught, or the value at, at the beginning, t equals 0. And then we can look at the uh, sine term. And of course, the sine term is going to oscillate in the opposite direction. So that it has a value of 0 at t equals 0, um, and then uh, a little later, we'll have a maximum. And so the actual full-on solution that we've just developed is going to be basically a combination of these two things. Uh, it's going to look uh, like the sum of those two curves, which I'm not going to try to draw. Um, and so we can satisfy the initial conditions for the initial uh, velocity and uh, displacement by adding those two solutions together. And now let's look at another form of the solution for the simple harmonic oscillator. Here we've got x of t is going to be equal to a cosine of omega t minus some phase angle delta. Now this uh, solution is going to be entirely equivalent to the solution we just developed, which was a combination of cosine and sine. Um, but, it, but in order to capture the two initial conditions that we have, x naught and v naught, we're going to incorporate uh, our, our constants of integration as the amplitude and a phase offset. So it's just a different way of expressing exactly the same thing. So let's start uh, by thinking about what this plot is going to look like, how the oscillations are going to appear. And let's start by uh, defining a phase angle phi to be equal to omega t minus delta. And so the phase angle is just the argument here for the cosine. And let's make a plot of what phi is going to do as a function of time. So here we're going to write t, and here's phi along the y-axis. At t equals 0, this term's going to be 0, and so uh, phi is just going to be negative delta. So here's negative delta. And then as time marches on, of course, this term's just going to increase. This term's going to remain constant. So phi is just going to go like this. It's just going to increase linearly with time and going to pass through a 0 at some late later time. And so if we want to then plot what the cosine of omega t minus delta is going to do, initially, at t equals 0, uh, that cosine is going to be x naught, right? That's that's our assumed initial condition. But that x naught, that doesn't necessarily represent the maximum amplitude for the oscillator, because remember, not only is the oscillator starting off with a non-zero displacement, it's starting off with a non-zero velocity. And so we can imagine a case, for instance, uh, where the um, oscillator started at x naught at t equals zero, and then actually the displacement increased until it reaches a maximum at the point when phi is equal to zero. And so the maximum amplitude for our oscillator is going to actually be 
whatever the value is uh, when phi is equal to zero, that amplitude is going to be a, of course, and that a is not necessarily going to be equal to x naught. In fact, it won't be equal to x naught if the oscillator has some non-zero velocity at the beginning. So then our, our oscillat oscillatory solution will just oscillate. But the point being that uh, the initial value uh, for our oscillator, x of t here, will not necessarily just be x naught. And that uh, offset between where the maximum occurs and where t equals zero is, is set by the value of delta. So delta is just a value that shifts the cosine solution to the left or to the right, depending on what the initial conditions x naught and v naught are. Okay. So let's see how to relate the amplitude and the phase, the, the phase angle delta, to the initial displacement x naught and initial velocity v naught. Okay. So x at zero is going to be x naught by definition. If we plug in t equals zero to our solution for x, we find that x naught has to be equal to a cosine of negative delta. Our initial velocity, x dot at zero, this will be v dot, v naught. If we take a time derivative of our solution for x of t and plug in t equals zero, we find that v naught has to be equal to minus a omega sine minus delta. We'll do a little changing here. So cosine, hopefully you recall that the cosine of a negative angle that's equal to the cosine of the angle itself because the cosine is an even function, meaning that cosine of a negative uh, value is equal to uh, cosine of the positive value, so that's the cosine. Hopefully you recall as well that the sine of a negative angle is equal to minus, excuse me, minus the sine minus the sine of, oops, excuse me, let's try that again, minus the sine minus the sine of that angle, excuse me, because remember that sine is an odd function, so sine looks like that. Okay, so we'll make these substitutions into these initial value uh, relationships. Okay, so here we go. We've got this right here. So x naught is going to be a cosine delta. Uh, v naught is going to be a omega sine delta. And so now, in principle, we have uh, two uh, equations for our two unknowns in terms of knowns. So now we just need to solve these for x, uh, for a and delta. So one simple way to do this is to um, divide one equation by the other. So if we divide the bottom equation by the top equation, the left-hand side becomes v naught over x naught. That's going to be omega sine delta over cos delta. This has the benefit of, of canceling out the a's. And so you can see we've got an omega times the tangent of delta. Hopefully you recall that the tangent of an angle is the sine of the cosine of that angle. And so what this says is delta is going to be equal to the inverse tangent of v naught over omega x naught. So that's one solution right there for delta. Now we want to go back and solve for a. Okay, so we're needing to solve for, for a. We have this expression for the tangent of delta. Uh, the trick here is that we need to figure out uh, that if we have an angle whose tangent is equal to this, what does that mean the cosine of the angle is? So we had to figure out how to relate the tangent delta here to the cosine delta. And the easiest way to do that is to, is to imagine a triangle that satisfies this relationship. So let's imagine we have a right triangle uh, where this angle here is delta. And if the tangent of delta is equal to omega x naught over v naught, then the opposite side here has to be omega x naught, or at least it can be written in that way. The adjacent side can be written as this. And then the hypotenuse is going to be uh, the square root of the sum of the squares. In other words, hypotenuse is going to be omega x naught squared plus v naught squared. Okay. And so now we see that we can easily write the cosine of the angle delta using this triangle. Cosine of the angle delta is going to be uh, adjacent 
over hypotenuse. Uh, in other words, cosine of delta is going to be, uh, let's see, omega x naught over square root of all of this here. I'll just skip having to write that to save some space. Okay. So that's going to be the cosine of our angle delta. And so now we can take this back in here, plug it in, and solve for a in terms of delta and x naught. So again, here's our two relationships. Um, just to simplify things, we can actually um, divide out this, this term here so that we divide it out on top and bottom. In other words, the cosine of delta it can be written as being equal to 1 over the square root of 1 plus v naught over omega x naught squared. So all we've done is divided out this term here. Okay. So we can plug in cosine delta, cosine delta to here, and what we find is that our initial our amplitude is going to be equal to all of this. We can take, just to simplify things even further, we can take x naught and put it inside here. And so we can show that a a is going to be equal to x naught squared plus v naught over omega squared square root of all of that. So here's our amplitude. And so an obvious question might occur to you at this point, how do we relate uh, the constants of integration for our first uh, version of the solution for the harmonic oscillator, the C1, uh, e to the i omega t plus C2, e to the minus i omega t, to this solution? So now here's our amplitude uh, for the solution. Let's, let's look at relating this amplitude, for example, uh, between the two different uh, solutions. Remember, our first solution looked like this. And we solve for these constants of integration here, C1 and C2, and those solutions look like this. Now, you might have noticed that, in fact, C1 and C2 are complex conjugates of one another. Meaning, if I calculate the complex conjugate of C2, I just end up with C1. And for those of you who don't remember, uh, the complex conjugate of a number, if we take a complex number C equal to R, or the real part, plus I times the imaginary part, the complex conjugate just means everywhere where you see an I, flip that sign. So a complex conjugate of a number just means flip the sign on I everywhere. And so you can see here that if we flip the sign on the I term for C2, we just get C1. Um, and so what that means is uh, if we were to calculate, say, C1's complex conjugate times itself, C1, we're going to get the same thing that we're going to get if we get uh, multiply C2 by its own complex conjugate. These are both going to be the same, and this is going to be equal to if we multiply, say, C1's complex conjugate by C2, or uh, C, uh, C2's complex conjugate by C1. We'll see that these relationships are important in a second. And so, let's take our solution for x of t and multiply it by its own complex conjugate, and we'll find that we get an expression for uh, the amplitude a that we just calculated using the second solution for the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so here we go. Uh, x star times x is going to give us this term. Here's x star here. So we're asking complex conjugate c1, complex conjugate c2, and up here in the exponents, we flip the sign on each of the uh, i terms, multiply all of that by x itself, and we get, and so we have c1 star c1 plus c2 star c2, and then we have these cross terms here, c1 star c2 times e to the minus 2i omega c2 star plus c2 star c1 times e to the plus 2i o omega t. So we've got all of this stuff here, okay. So now let's calculate what these things uh, look like, these uh, constants dotted uh, multiplied by themselves. So for instance, C1 star, C C1, uh, here's the complex conjugate of C1, here's C1 itself. Um, we're going to multiply these first, outside, inside, last, um, and you get uh, the following, 1 quarter, x naught squared plus v naught over omega squared.
this should look very familiar. This is actually 1 quarter a squared from our previous solution. Okay, so we'll do the same thing, calculation for C1, uh, C2 star times C2, C1 star C2, all of that. What we'll find is, it, is, it, is that all of these terms up here work out to give exactly the same expression. And so let's finally write out what x star times x actually looks like. So x star x is uh, this term, so that's actually c1 star times c1 plus c2 star times c2, and then we've got these cross terms down here. So if we evaluate x star x at t equals 0, we find that we're just going to get x naught squared plus v over omega squared, and that is exactly equal to a squared. And so we see that the two solutions match up uh, exactly at t equals 0, just as they're supposed to. And in fact, they'll match up at every point along uh, the timeline, because they ought to. The, the two solutions have to be entirely equivalent. And so uh, the bottom line for all of this is that there are several different ways to solve uh, the harmonic oscillator motion. You can use complex numbers. You can use cosines with phase shifts, all kinds of different ways. The book reviews all of them. They all work out to be exactly equivalent. The key is whatever solution you use, uh, it needs to be oscillatory, and it needs to involve two constants of integration. Um, in some cases, those will be two complex conjugates, or excuse me, in some cases, they'll be two, two complex numbers. In other cases, they'll just be an amplitude and a phase shift.